Terra incognita spectator. Terra incognita spectator. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. While this is only our second show, we have been bitten by the Christmas spirit, so we're bringing you not one, but two pieces of original speculative fiction from two authors who are currently on the rise in Australia. Cat Sparks has been a powerhouse of Australian independent speculative fiction publishing since the early 2000s, with the creation of the highly successful Agog Press imprint. But more recently, she's been producing a string of award-winning short stories. Her piece for TISF, The Bride Price, tells of a nobleman's search for the perfect bride and what happens when he comes face to face with reality. Adam Brown's work is noted for his deft use of language, the originality of his ideas and his wicked sense of humour. His story, Blood Drunk, ranks amongst the strangest apocalyptic visions you're ever likely to come across. And please remember to visit www.tisf.com.au for links to the author's websites. And so, to begin with, Cat Sparks reads The Bride Price. The Rococo splendour of the lobby did not faze Padraic, but the thought of selecting his future bride filled him with an unaccustomed nervousness. How old did you say they are? he asked. His companion, Dasan, also unimpressed by the finery of their surroundings, gave a slight shrug as their footsteps echoed loudly through the hall. Not old enough, he said. Not yet. We select them early so that they may begin their training. Did you not read the brochures? Do you never listen to a word I say? Padraic laughed, the small, polite sounds of an uncomfortable man. Of course I listen. I listen to every word. But this place terrifies you. Of course it does. It's only natural to feel this way. Brides are an expensive business. Choose poorly and your father will never forgive you. Padraic fingered the edges of his jewelled collar studs. I will not choose poorly. Perhaps I will not choose at all. Perhaps I will not meet a girl that I like. Dasan laughed. You won't like any of them. You will love them all. And furthermore, you will find it impossible to choose a mere one to take as wife. But choose you must. Your father is strict and he will be most annoyed if I do not bring you home to New Sarah's with the bride arranged. Padraic dropped his hand to his side. Ahead of them, below a magnificent archway of red and gold striped brick, enormous doors of lacquered oak swung inwards to reveal a petite woman in a red embossed kimono, standing with her hands clasped. As she bowed in greeting, Padraic noticed the stillness of her hair, every blonde strand fixed firmly in its place. Her hair contains as much lacquer as those doors, he whispered, nudging his friend. Shh, replied Dasan. Madam Lotus, what a delight to see you again. I swear you have not aged a day since my last visit. Madam Lotus bowed again, deeper this time. The two men stopped a few feet before her. Dasan bowed in return, the slight condescending motion of the exceedingly wealthy. Padraic's bow was deeper, fueled by uncertainty. My lord's firstborn is in need of a wife, said Dasan. We have come all the way from New Serres. Padraic felt the blood calling in his veins as Madame Lotus cast her eye upon him. His face was the first point to come under scrutiny, the arch of his brows and the shape of his nose. Next his shoulders and torso. Madame Lotus took one delicate step forward and then another. She moved around him, examining him as if he were an alabaster sculpture. I have many brides to choose from, she said, licking her lips, but three of my girls in particular will most suit your needs, I think. Madame Lotus is never wrong, said Dasan. You'll do well to follow her advice. I will choose my own wife, said Padraic. Of course you will, said Madame Lotus. She clapped her hands once and a bevy of assistants appeared from the darkness glimpsed behind the wooden doors. Without laying a hand on his person, they whisked Padraic swiftly through the doors and out of the lobby. When Padraic glanced back, he saw that Dasan had remained behind to talk business with Madame Lotus. "'Aren't you coming with me? What if I make the wrong choice?' he cried, his voice reverberating off the distant walls. Dasan turned his head. "'You will choose well. 
I have every faith in you, my friend. Every faith. The heady sense of honeysuckle and passion flower filled his senses as Padraic was blindfolded and led down passages that twisted and turned. His query about the need for a blindfold was met with peals of delicate laughter and still more floral scents, some familiar, some not. When at last the veil was lifted, Padraic found himself in a chamber, its walls thickly padded with elaborate tapestries. The chamber appeared ancient, yet it smelled like a summer garden. The assistants fussed around him, flitting and tittering like birds. In a couple of heartbeats he was seated on a low lounge, his back propped up with cushions plumped and fluffed. His shoes were whisked away, replaced by slippers. Firm hands massaged his shoulders. A tall drink stood by his right hand, and beside it a tray of sweetmeats. He began to relax, overcome with drowsiness. I do not have to choose a wife, he reminded himself. I have only to examine the girls on offer. You must not make your choice based on beauty alone. Padraic sat up with a start. He had felt no additional pressure on the lounge, not noticed the older woman settle herself beside him. Severe in her kimono and immaculate make-up, she might have been Madame Lotus's sister. They are all lovely, but each possesses individual talents and traits. You should consider your business needs as you make your selection. Ask some questions. Ask them anything you like. A young girl entered the chamber. Her face lit up with joy when she saw Padraic. As he opened his mouth to speak, another entered, followed by a third, a fourth, a fifth and a sixth. Padraic felt his heartbeat race, his throat constrict with imagined thirst. They were so very young, and yet they held themselves with the grace of mature women. As they nestled at his feet, he felt as if he had known each one for ages. Comfort and familiarity, that was what he felt. The girls spoke their names in turn. Caris, Toba, Mishi, Jade, Coral and Roma. Padraic glanced from face to face, searching for anything that might make his decision easier. A blemish or a frown, a sense of falseness or insecurity. Questions, said the old woman beside him. Ask them questions. She had not offered her own name. Where are you from? Padraic asked, none of the girls in particular. Some sort of signal passed from the older woman to the seated girls, so that Karis understood she would be the one to answer. I was born on Alpha Nerve, my village so small it does not have a name. My parents were farmers once, but now their lands lie fallow with grain blight. I have eight brothers and sisters, and all of them go hungry. Should I be selected for marriage, my bride price will set them up on new fertile land. No one will starve again. Caris's eyes shone with held back tears as she told her story. Each of the other girls nodded in sympathy. My parents are dead, said Jade, killed by a tsunami. My sisters and I were raised by my grandmother. Now she's too old to work and we must fend for ourselves. I'm the eldest, said Toba. Things are not well on the outer rim, said the older woman, intruding into Padraig's absorption so much that he almost scowled at her. Those who are able flee to New Ceres and the other successful colonies. Those who cannot must manage as best they can. Padraig listened to more of the girls' stories, nodding with sympathy at the harshness of their lives. The older woman soon steered the conversation in other directions, directions designed to showcase the girls' wit and charm. Amidst discussions on the value of poetry, Padraig leaned forward and questioned Caris suddenly. How does it make you feel to be sold as a wife so that your family may prosper? Would you not come to resent that it was you who paid the price? Caris smiled kindly, her lips set firmly with determination. I would consider myself fortunate indeed to have a husband such as yourself. When Padraic's meeting with the girls concluded, the older woman escorted him down a wide marble corridor and into another lounge area very similar to the first. This room was filled with reclining men and attendants, all women serving refreshments. A haze of pale blue smoke hung above them, scenting the air with the aromatic familiarity of tobacco and herbs. The lounge beside Dasan sat vacant. Padraig took his place and nodded as an elegant woman in a pale pink kimono served him iced tea in a tall frosted glass. Dasan smoked, drawing deeply on the nargila's elongated stem. Padraic watched the smoke curl and dance within the glass bowl of the apparatus. "'Were you able to choose?' Dasan asked, after exhaling an exuberant lungful. 
Padraig shook his head. It is no matter, said Dasan, as he passed the stem to his friend. Your body will have chosen for you. The selection rooms are designed containing sensitive monitoring apparatus. Your vital signs were recorded as you encountered each girl, your conversation closely assessed. All data will be cross-referenced. There is one amongst the many. Trust me on that. Padraig pressed the stem against his lips, then paused. They were all so lovely, so young, and yet... Not like ordinary new Ceresian girls. Is that what you're thinking? Dasan laughed. And indeed they are not. Madame Lotus charges a great deal of money for the skills that she imparts. When you get your bride home, the true value of the purchase will become evident. Padraig nodded, still holding the stem of the Nargila without smoking. They are wives, Dasan, not purchases. As you say. Dasan clicked his fingers to summon an attendant. My friend here would like a massage. He is very tense. Padraig sat up suddenly as if waking from a dream, the Nargila stem in his hand forgotten. No, he said, I would not like a massage. I would like to speak with Madame Lotus about my wife. The attendant led him to another chamber, this one smaller than the others, featuring a single low lounge beside an elaborate floral display. Next to the lounge, Madame Lotus waited, and beside her, Caris, holding her hands, palms up, one cupped delicately inside the other. Padraic glanced at Madame Lotus. He wanted to yell at her, tell her that he couldn't be expected to make such an important decision under so much pressure, that the time allowed for choosing was not enough. How much time would ever be enough? But Caris's eyes shone with adoration, fixed on his every step as he walked across the chamber floor. Madame Lotus and the attendant left them alone, exiting without a word. Karis reached for his hand and motioned for him to sit beside her on the lounge. I know what you are thinking, she whispered, that it's too soon to know if you can love me, too soon to be the judge of a matter of such importance. She placed his hand between her own, such tiny palms, he thought, such delicate fingers. But you should know that I feel no such hesitation. My own heart is free of doubt. I knew as soon as I saw you. You're the one, Padraic. You are the one I want. Padraic cupped her face in his hands, his thumb brushing the soft peach skin of her cheek. He stared into her emerald eyes and knew that she meant every word of it. How old are you, Karis? She blinked, sending shivers down his spine. I shall be fifteen standard earth years old when you return for me. I shall be a woman fully grown and ready to be your wife. As he took her in his arms and kissed her, Padraic felt an object being pressed into his hands. He looked down at an ornate porcelain key inlaid with jewels. Take this key back to New Serres with you as a sign of good faith, Caris explained. When you return, you will exchange it for me. Padraic nodded. The key was symbolic a receipt for the down payment on her bride price. We will meet again in one year's time, she whispered, and then in a heartbeat was gone, led away by yet another of the nameless attendants that served as staff in Madame Lotus's world. When escorted back to the Rococo lobby, Padraic was shocked to find Dasan tossing a porcelain key in his palm, a key almost identical to his own. But you already have a wife, he said. Dasan brought a finger to his lips as the two of them were escorted back outside the building to where a shuttle waited to return them to their vessel. Padraic still clutched his key in his hands. Dasan had pocketed his already. His mind moved on to other things. Padraic waited for the appropriate moment. But what of your wife? What of Lauren? I have grown tired of her, Dasan said at last. Lauren no longer pleases me. But what of your children? Dasan shrugged. What of them? My children belong to me. Lauren has no legal claim to children's side through surrogates. The eggs come with the wife, one of the advantages of doing business with Madame Lotus. No messy family complications should you change your mind. It's all part of the bride price. Padraic considered Dasan's words as the older man made a string of business calls and notations in his planner. He wondered what would become of Lauren, but felt too uncomfortable to ask the question. Instead, Padraic stared out the shuttled window at the cityscape below, admiring the ordered shapes of civilization, the straightness of roads and the brilliance of blue pools inlaid like jewels. Lauren will be taken care of, Dasan admitted at last. She will be offered an apartment and employment. The company will see to it. 
Such details are their concern, not mine. But she is your wife. No, my friend, she was. Business is business. I am a primary executive merchant. I work hard to keep your father rich. I deserve a new wife as reward. Padraig slipped a hand into his pocket to wrap his fingers around Madame Lotus's jewelled key. Its surface felt smooth and cool against his fingertips. He turned it over and over again, mulling over the uncertainties the day had brought forth. I will take good care of Karis, he promised himself. I will never be like Dasan. Why has the ship stopped? Why are we not moving? The complaints of business travels and the chink-chink of dice on tabletops muted the soft music seeping from the walls of the cruiser's first-class passenger lounge. The music, designed to pacify nervous travellers, irritated Pedraic as much as the lounge itself did. It seemed as though he spent half his life in spaces such as these, luxurious pauses separating where he had been from where his father would have him go next and always the inevitable attendants proffering refreshments or whatever other service was required. As the slender girl in charcoal silk burnt forward to place a cocktail at his armrest, a drink he had not asked for, he grabbed her wrist. What is the problem, he demanded. Why have we stopped? The girl stood still, waiting patiently for Padraic to release her. The captain apologises for the inconvenience, she said. A refugee transportation container from the outer colonies is stranded in this sector. We are legally obliged to offer assistance. Padraic released her as murmurs of outrageous and unbelievable filled the space along with a series of exasperated sighs. Dasan pulled his favourite possession from his pocket, an antiquated fob watch believed to have been from Earth itself. He flipped its gold case open with his thumb and frowned, then slouched his body into the comfortable recesses of the lounge chair. Padraic knew that the girl who had been serving drinks would whisk the empty glasses away and next time she returned it would be with a selection of game boards and dice, although dice would be unnecessary. Men such as Dasan carried their own in their pockets as lucky charms. Dasan's dice were made of ivory, carved from the tusks of long extinct earth beasts. Alongside the game boards would come the nargilas, one to be placed strategically amidst each group, the stem to be passed from lip to lip in a gesture of equality and friendship. Dasan and his companions would get gently stoned and gamble away a few thousand credits to help the time pass. Padraic stood suddenly, leaving his drink untouched. No one challenged him as he left the lounge and his companions to the rattle and clink of precious ivory and crystal flute. Padraic did not know where he was headed, nor indeed how far it was possible to explore within the confines of the ship. He decided to walk until somebody stopped him. He didn't worry about getting lost. No matter where he went, eventually there would be a man or a woman in a crisp braided uniform to guide him gently back to the comfort of his cabin, just as there always had been his whole life. Now and then he would dip his fingers into his pocket and touch the key to reassure himself that the events of the past day had been real. He pictured Karis, her wide green eyes shining, and he wondered what became of Madame Lotus's other girls, the ones not selected as wives. As Padraig left one corner behind and entered the next, he expected to encounter many travellers like himself and Dasan, but the cruiser's bars and private lounges were empty. The absence of sound disturbed him. He could not even hear his own footfall on the luxuriant carpet. My world is hermetically sealed, he told himself. Every part of it controlled at every point. Eventually he reached an elevator. Should I go up or down, he wondered. Down seemed the more appealing selection, so he chose it. Moments later he stepped inside, and in the seconds following his brief descent, the doors parted and Padraig stepped into an empty space. A storage bay of some sort, he presumed. His footsteps echoed loudly on metal floors as he continued his exploration. As he walked, he began to hear faint, muffled sounds from somewhere up ahead. At the far side of the space he found another elevator, this one only offering the option of down. He entered its battered-looking metal cage, travelled downwards for a few moments. When the doors parted, he stepped out into another world. The smell hit him first, the stench of unwashed bodies, followed abruptly by the sound of children crying amidst a sea of utter disorganisation. Everywhere he looked were people standing, sitting or lying prostrate. Some huddled together in groups, cowering from those others who ran amongst them, knocking bundles of goods to the ground in their wake. The air was thick with chatter, so much so that it was impossible to think. 
impossible to breathe in the cloying human stink. And yet Padraig did not turn around and call the elevator back. He stood still for a moment to calm himself, blinking imagined smoke from his eyes. As he accustomed himself to the smell, he began to notice little things. The people around him were not all of the same race, nor were they of the same social caste. As he stepped amongst them, moving forward through to whatever gaps became apparent, he noted that while some of the refugees, for who else could they possibly be, were dressed in tatters, others were garbed not so differently from himself in finely spun expensive cotton shirts and business slacks. Their shirts were soiled from the rigours of uncomfortable travel, but the quality was evident, as it was also in their mannerisms, the way they carried themselves. And yet others seemed as if they had never known the safety of home. Women with lank hair and bony arms clutched at filthy, squalling children. Some tried their best to sleep, although Padraig wondered how anyone could ever hope to sleep in such confusion. The faces of the sleepers were still as stone, as if, having finally laid their heads down, they would stay that way forever. Each step took him further from the safety of the elevator, deeper into the struggling human tide, until he was sure he could feel its very pulse. No one touched him. No one bothered him, and this only added to his sense of confusion. He was not one of them, even if his cleanliness was the only thing keeping them apart. Why weren't these people hanging off his clothes and begging him for help? He walked on amidst the chaos. Abruptly, one voice distinguished itself from all the others. Padraig looked to its source and saw a woman with her hair bound up in a scrap of purple cloth. She moved amongst the mass, calling out a single name. The name of a lost child, he presumed, after the swift movements of two boys playing tag attracted his attention. Her face had seen too much harsh sunlight, he thought. She's probably not as old as she looks. Her gaze fell upon him for a moment, then moved on as she continued her search. He did not intend to follow her, but a jostling in the crowd behind him forced him forward. And so forward he continued, listening to the fire in her voice as she cried, Henna! Henna! over and over. The woman carried a cloth bag and a red plastic container slung across her back. She trod carefully, and Padraig saw that her boots, although worn, were sturdy and practical in design. Her calves, too, were strong and muscular. He followed as close as he dared, trying to keep a respectable distance, yet worried about losing her in the crowd. Eventually she ducked below a makeshift awning. When he moved the cloth aside, she was gone. Unsure of himself, both why he followed her and where he was headed, he paused for a moment to catch his breath, amazed that he could no longer distinguish the dirt of the people around him. His sense of smell had become acclimatised, as had his sense of personal space. He had stopped flinching when others accidentally brushed against him. Padraig craned his neck in search of the woman, strained his ears to try and catch the sharpness of her voice. Suddenly there it was again, this time behind him. "'Why are you following me?' she demanded as he spun around. "'I'm not,' he began. "'You were following me just now,' she stated. "'What is it you think you want?' Padraig considered. "'Who is Henna?' "'Who are you?' she replied. "'No one of consequence.' Indeed, she said, making a show of eyeing his fine white shirt and jewelled collar studs. How unfortunate for you that your captain was obliged to stop and pick up common refugees. How tiresome it must be. Padraig had opened his mouth to argue when the sound of another woman's wailing sang out clearly above the bustle and hubbub of the throng. Henna, cried the woman beside him as she ran towards the terrible sound, her quarrel with Padraig dismissed. Padraig followed her instinctively, trying to keep up without tripping over boxes, bags and bundles of well-worn possessions. The crowd thinned to reveal a woman seated on a mat surrounded by other women. She clutched a bundle to her breast and cried, the most mournful sound Padraig had ever heard. It did not need anyone to explain the scene to him. The bundle was her dead baby. The women around her made comforting noises, but there was nothing they could do. The guards will come soon to take the babe away, said a woman's voice. Her again, the woman with the headscarf he had originally followed. The rules of transportation are very strict. Those who die are to be jettisoned into space. There can be no exceptions. Is this Henna, the one you were calling? The woman shook her head. Henna is my daughter. I do not know this woman's name. I'm sure the authorities will perform the... These women are of the Urzu faith, the woman explained, 
her dead infant must be washed in clean water and blessed, then wrapped in a clean cotton shroud before burial. The ritual is vital to the passage of the soul. Without it, the babe will walk in limbo. Padraic studied the crying woman's face, the redness of her eyes, the lines of pain etched by grief. Then we must see that it is done. The woman in the headscarf shook her head. You rich have no understanding of anything, no knowledge of anything practical. Her eyes scanned the crowd again in search of her daughter. Padraic followed her gaze to where a girl of about twelve years stood clutching a bucket to her chest. Henna, don't run off like that. Stay where I can see you. Henna looked up at her mother, then returned her gaze to the crying woman with the dead baby. This container was never designed to transport so many people, explained Henna's mother. There's not enough water to spare for washing. The red plastic squares everyone carries, they hold our drinking allowance. We're permitted no more than that. I have plenty of water. I will go back to my cabin and get some for her, said Padraic. That is very kind, but do you really think your friends will let you back down here bearing such a gift? Look around you. These people are exhausted. Most of them are glad to have made it this far. They're not thinking straight. They haven't considered what might be available on the ship that's transporting as the final leg of the journey to New Serres. Should they consider it and decide to help themselves, I doubt your people could stop them. What is your name? he asked. Allah. Allah, my name is Padraic and I am a man of my word. I will bring her water and I will be discreet about it. Allah smiled sadly. He could tell she didn't believe him. The murmuring of the crowd lessened as a bearded man in pale blue robes pushed his way to the mat where the bereaved woman and her companions were sitting. One of the companions stood to greet him. Instinctively the crowd inched back to give them space. Some moved away for additional privacy, but the gaps were soon filled by others keen to watch. The companion and the bearded man conversed in low whispers. Below them on the mat, the woman with the dead baby cried, moving backwards and forwards in a rocking motion, clutching her child like she would never let it go. Five hundred cubic centimetres of drinking water each day is our allotment. Barely sufficient to sustain life, said Allah. We're due no more until tomorrow. There were supposed to be sonic showers set up for us, but I haven't seen them. Our evacuation was sudden, fortuitous. We were allowed to bring only what we could carry. A new life awaits us on new Sarah's in every respect. I will bring water, said Padraic. There isn't time. The guards will know about the deaths already, she said, gesturing to the surveillance nodes embedded in the low ceiling. They won't be far away. Over Allah's shoulder, Padraic could see the blue-robed priest standing, listening with a look of stillness on his face. The woman sobbing ebbed. She seemed exhausted, as if she had no more tears to cry. Suddenly another sound separated itself from the general murmuring of the crowd. A young girl's voice, clear and shrill. Once again, Padraic craned his neck for a better view. Allah's daughter, the girl called Henna, moved from person to person, the bucket clasped tightly against her chest. Just a spoonful for the baby. One spoonful you can spare, no more. At first there was no reaction. Some shunned her defiantly. Others lowered their gaze so as to not have to meet her fierce stare. But most, after a prolonged pause, reached for their precious red plastic container, unscrewed the cap and dribbled a little splash into the bucket. Just a little, but a little from the many would be enough. Finally, when she had coaxed enough water to make a sloshing sound, Hannah took the bucket to the woman with the baby and placed it at her feet. The priest nodded, understanding, the beginnings of a smile cracking his rugged features. Padraic smiled too, but Allah did not. I swear we have only made it this far by Hannah's rat cunning, she said. She's a good-hearted child, tough but kind. It's her begging that's kept us fed these past two seasons. There are still some decent city folk who'll throw scraps to a hungry child. But the water's no use without the white cotton. Henna doesn't understand. As the priest crouched down beside the woman, someone cried out, The guards are coming! All but one of the mother's female companions leapt to their feet, linking arms to form a protective circle around the mat. Padraic and Ulla were shoved in separate directions as a contingent of uniformed men pushed their way forward, the clanking of their body armour contrasting sharply with the murmuring of the crowd. Unsure at first of what to do, Padraic took his place in defence of the mat. He studied the red and gold braid of the guard's uniforms, the glossy sheen of the weapons gripped tightly in their gloved hands as they approached. This is not necessary, he said calmly. 
The mother wants only. The nearest of the guards shoved him roughly to one side with the butt of his weapon. Another stepped forward, pushing Padraig to the ground. In that moment, the crowd of refugees surged and Padraig's voice was lost in a sea of angry outcries. Others stepped in to fill the spaces, separating the mat and the guards. Padraig clambered to his feet, gripping his bruised flesh as he heard the sharp click-clack of weapons being armed. Surely they would not fire upon these innocent people, he thought. Surely not. Above, the glassy note of the surveillance system observed impassively. He searched for Hannah and Allah, but all he could see were the heads and shoulders of the enraged refugees. Behind him, the atonal chanting of the priest began. Would the ritual words be enough without the white cloth for the baby shroud? The crowd surged again. As Padraig raised his arms to steady his balance, he noticed the fine white linen weave of his own shirt. Quickly he turned his back on the guards. He needed time to think, but there was no time. Padraig fought his way to where the mother sat, pulling his shirt over his shoulders as he moved. This garment is clean, he shouted to the priest. I have only worn it this hour past. It is of the finest cotton. Will it suffice? The priest glanced up from his ministrations. He did not understand Padraig's tongue, but he looked down to see what he was clutching in his hands. Suddenly he nodded enthusiastically, reaching out to take the shirt. Padraig stepped back as the priest spread the shirt on the mat. With the bucket beside him, the priest gestured to the mother's companion. The woman gently prized the dead infant from the mother's arms. She passed it to the priest and he stripped it of its swaddling, chanting as he worked. He held the infant tenderly, scooping handfuls of water from the bucket, anointing each of the babe's tiny limbs in turn as he chanted with a slow, steady rhythm. With each moment, the anger of the crowd intensified. Padraig clutched his bruised shoulder, expecting every minute to hear gunfire. But the guards did not fire. Suddenly, in unison, they shouldered their weapons and waited for reinforcements. They stood still as automatons, eyes staring blankly ahead. The noise of the crowd fell away, layer by layer, until all that could be heard was the priests chanting. Finally that sound, too, ceased. The circle of women parted and the mother stepped through, her white shrouded baby clasped tightly in her arms. She presented herself to the guards and allowed herself to be led away, accompanied by the priest and her companion. It was over. The general murmuring of regular conversation returned as people separated into small groups, linking their arms, laughing with relief that matters had not become much worse. Padraig, still clutching his shoulder, watched Henna stoop to retrieve the empty bucket. It was only then that he noticed a detail he had somehow missed earlier, a detail concealed by the oversized shirt she wore. The child's left arm was missing past the elbow. A landmine. When she was five, said Allah, who had been watching him the whole time. She says the missing flesh sometimes pains her, although I don't see how it could. I will buy her a new arm, said Padraic, his eyes shining. On you, Sarah's? Allah shook her head. Such technology is forbidden, as you well know. She has managed without it these past seven years, and she will continue to do so. I can make her whole again, he said, placing his hand on Allah's shoulders. I have great wealth. I can make anything happen. Allah smiled kindly. The gift of your shirt was much appreciated, but my daughter does not need your help. He looked to Henna again just in time to see her duck behind an awning as two uniformed guards approached, these ones with their weapons holstered. Sir, we have instructions to escort you back to the first class lounge, said the nearest of them. I will find you, he called back at Allah as the guards marched him back towards the elevators. I will take care of you both. Allah smiled again as the guards took him away. "'You have been gambling, I see,' laughed Dasan. "'This time the shirt off your back. "'You must pay better attention. "'Who knows what you'll lose next time?' "'Not nearly as much as I almost gave away for nothing,' Padraic thought, heading for his suite. "'Hey!' Dasan called after him. "'I want to know the details. "'Is it true you went wandering amongst the refugees? "'I take my eye off you for five minutes.' Back in his suite, Padraig pulled the porcelain key from his pocket. He tossed it in his palm, feeling the weight of it against his skin. Dasan's face appeared around the corner. His eyes shone from the effect of too much drink. There are plenty of well-bred hostesses on this ship. You only have to ask. Dasan, Padraig said. I am not ready for marriage. I have seen nothing. I have been nowhere outside my father's realm. But I will honour the girl who is linked to this key. 
I will not allow her family to starve on my account. Dasan smirked. Is that what she told you? A heart-wrenching tale of poverty and desperation. He threw back his head and laughed heartily, his body slouching against the door frame. Those girls are bred for the bride market. Obedient wives sold before they were even conceived. None of them have ever starved. Why do you think Madame Lotus runs her business so far away from civilised space? Laws are lax. Not everywhere is like New Ceres, my friend. Padraig's fingers tightened around the porcelain key. Put a shirt on, said Dasan. Then come back up and have a drink. As Dasan left, Padraig held the key up high. Elaborately engraved, indulgently ornate, it disgusted him, as did everything it represented. He threw it across the room as hard as he could, shattering it into pieces against the far wall. Valet, the refugees aboard this ship. Where are they to be set down? I am sorry, sir, replied his room's communications node. That information is not currently available. You will let me know the minute it is available, he snapped. Certainly, sir, replied the valet. I will find you, Allah, Padraig said to his mirror reflection. I will find you both and make you safe. He wondered what his father would say if he caught his son sheltering a refugee woman and her amputee child in his home, but he found for the first time in his life he didn't give a damn about what his father thought. And now, Adam Brown reads Blood Drunk. The day I ask Josephine out is the same day the media first mentions the virus, just a curiosity piece in a couple of the papers. It gives us something to chat about during our early awkward dates. I think the story is an urban myth, but she's not so sure. I press the point. Even on a biochemical level, it seems unlikely, I say. A disease that renders serum fats into glycerin, then generates nitrates from urea, then blends the two compounds in the correct ratio. If it's real, I say, it must be a very smart virus. She nods reluctantly, deferring to my training. But I can tell she's not convinced. Things progress. The development of our romance coincides with the reports of further deaths. The accounts are more credible now, the nature of the disease coming clearer. The news pieces, though brief, have a more serious tone. The commentators who continue to doubt the reality of the virus start to sound a little shrill. Some claim the victims are suicide bombers, although they certainly don't fit the profile. A Scottish Minister of Parliament, a house husband in Canada, a girls' school ice hockey team in Iceland. Then one morning I wake and realise, just like that, that I believe. Josephine was right. I'd simply been afraid to face it before. This thing is real. I begin reading virology journals. Those researchers who give the virus credence are still in the minority, but the number is growing. There are debates about whether it's a bioweapon or not. It seems impossible that such a thing could evolve on its own. I read papers suggesting it's a rhinovirus, transmitted in coughs and sneezes, then others speculating it's like an explosive variant of Ebola, transmitting itself in the aerosolized spray of blood and bone produced in the victim's final moment. Later, it turns out both models are correct. A new phrase comes into use, blood drunk, referring to the disease in its early stages. I see a television documentary about the brave epidemiologist who wore the body armour of a bomb disposal engineer to isolate nitrous oxide from the blood of patients. The theory is that it's a byproduct of the nitrogen reactions generated by the virus, producing dizziness, euphoria, etc. But we've always been blood drunk, Josephine says over dinner one night. All this is nothing new, she says, a little drunk herself. She feels no different now to how she's felt all her life, she says. I remember she spent part of her childhood in Belfast. Her father died there. She'd told me that early on. She's always felt the need to keep her head down, she says, to keep out of the crosshairs of history. The difference now is we no longer need bombs to blow ourselves up. The arms manufacturers must be furious, she says, laughing, but then the laughter turns to sobs and I take her home. That night we sleep together for the first time. The next morning we see a news article that indicates the virus is non-species specific. The term is zoonosis, transmission between humans and animals. There are reports from South America, some obscure seabird, Olrog's gulls, dying in sad little blood and feather bursts over the South Atlantic. Then, later that week, it's the gastric breeding frogs. Shots on TV of entire colonies going up like Chinese New Year in the depths of the Queensland rainforest. Next day it's the cattle, herds of them hamburgered in nasty chain reaction cluster blasts. Meadows turn to cratered moonscapes, smelling of blood and barbecue, and suddenly things are going downhill fast. We're at the steep end of the curve. More and more species, a global epidemic. Attempts to create a vaccine are unsuccessful or disastrous. The economy falters, not just here, but worldwide. Those countries not in a state of denial or in a state of emergency. Looting, rationing of food or water. It feels like the end of the world. Josephine moves in with me. My house is bigger, better security, should that become an issue. I'm sick with dread, but Josephine is oddly cheerful. She has a kind of happy fatalism. 
She's more relaxed than I've ever seen her, despite that she's suffering a miserable head cold. And after a while, I begin to find her mood infectious. I relax into a feeling of luxurious resignation. When, soon after, I see my first actual example of the disease, it's in the garden, a flock of cabbage moth butterflies disappearing in a brief, wet crackle cascade. It seems almost festive. Childhood memories of Krakenite. A few days later, we go upstairs to watch the sunset from my balcony. I've got Josephine's cold by now, and should be feeling wretched. The sky is beautiful, reminiscent of that time back in the 90s when Mount Pinatubo made the dusks so spectacular. Birds wheel clamorously overhead, sparrows, swallows and miners returning to their nests. I turn to look at Josephine. She's swaying in her seat. As I realise, am I? Have we been drinking? I can't seem to recall. I take her hand, tell her I love her, but the words are lost under a series of explosions from overhead. Charred feathers fall over the balcony. Another flock detonates in an elm nearby. Wet thunder. Pyrotechnics backlighting the foliage. In the yard next door, a Labrador barks, frightened. Dogs are always scared of fireworks, until, with a big, boomy blood burst, he's gone too. Things are speeding up, I say, and Josephine nods abstractedly. I see all the trees are burning, on my property and up and down the street. Autumn colours bright among the branches. But Josephine's more interested in the lawn, which is alive with flashes of blue light, cicadas, I guess, popping merrily, the little deaths lighting the dark. Now the air itself is sparkling, mosquitoes flaring in pretty little glitter twinkles. Is it our blood that has infected them? A fruit bat is spinning by, spewing Catherine Wheel flames when we hear a big roar from down the street. A house has gone up, then another, the smoke smelling of Sunday roasts, and the street is awash with blood, rivulets bright burning blue, and suddenly Josephine are naked to the bonfire night, and laughing as we make sick giddy love, the virus taking us closer and closer. This month's review is Incandescence by Greg Egan. The main thrust of Greg Egan's latest book seems to have been to educate, but in doing so he missed out on what I believe is a fundamental of writing in this genre, that SF, hard, soft or somewhere in between, has to entertain as well as amaze. In the novel, which is set in the same universe as his excellent short story Riding the Crocodile, the sentient species of the Amalgam have colonised the galaxy, and some are even crossing the void to other galaxies as information packets ready to be re-embodied when they arrive. Luckily for Rakesh, a jaded young man of only a thousand years of age, there is still one part of his galaxy that is off-limits. The galactic centre is controlled by the Aloof, who, as their name suggests, don't like visitors, and rebuff any attempts at dialogue. Until now, that is. Rakesh meets Lal, who was waylaid by the aloof while taking a shortcut and given a puzzle to solve. A meteor discovered deep in aloof territory contains DNA that is similar to amalgam precursor DNA. The meteor hints at a violent event in its past, and the question remains whether the life that it held still exists somewhere in the galactic centre. The aloof are willing to allow entry into their domain in order to mount a rescue mission. This is just the sort of mission Rakesh has been waiting for, and he quickly agrees to play interstellar detective. Meanwhile, Roy, one of the beings Rakesh seeks, is living on the splinter, a piece of rock circling a neutron star deep in the centre of the galaxy. Happy with her life, she meets Zack, who opens up her mind to new thoughts and ideas about the world she lives inside, and not a moment too soon, because the splinter is in danger of being ripped apart again by tidal forces if the inhabitants can't figure out a way to understand and then control its orbit. Rakesh's situation is very familiar to anyone who's read the new space opera or any number of recent SF novels. The trouble, it seems, with the far future is that it's very boring. It's a real problem facing today's writers, because by creating a future instrumentality that is, by definition, perfect, It's the machines that get to do all the cool stuff, while the augmented humans hang around in the virtual equivalent of an airport lounge gazing at their navels. Luckily for Greg, his universe has the aloof, omnipotent, uncommunicative, and not necessarily nice, to set up engaging final frontiers for protagonists like Rakesh to cross. In the scenes within the splinter, however, things come slightly off the rails. 
Roy is a quick study, and the null line chamber deep inside the rock, where gravity is effectively cancelled out, is an excellent place to observe directly what Newton could only theorise. The experiments to discover the nature of the splinter and its place in the galaxy begin slowly. And there's a great deal of pleasure derived from tracking how simple maths and science concepts are inferred by Roy and Zach from observation and experimentation. I suspect as the two attract more and more group members to work on their problems, that Greg is portraying and celebrating that collegiate scientific community of practice that is behind so many startling breakthroughs. But as the experiments progress and they move from first principles through Newtonian physics into Einsteinian space-time, I got a bit lost, started feeling stupid, and consequently my enjoyment of these sections faded, and I began wanting to skip forward to the next Rakesh scene. A few more diagrams might have helped, but if I wanted to understand space-time to that degree, I'd buy a textbook, not read a novel. Interestingly, the Rakesh narrative deals with far more exotic science, and here Greg flexes his descriptive muscles very nicely to conjure up the wonder of travel in a region of space where the stars are too close together, while explaining just enough of the physical effects of such a place and the technology required to conduct a search there to drop our jaws without confusing us. I think the difference here had to do with the degree of detail Greg uses. With Rakesh, we get just enough information to infer and understand at a macro level the wow factor. With Roy and Zach, we get swamped in far too much detail. Once you fight through the classroom physics, however, there are some very effective breaks as the plot develops. At one point, a scale shift relating to the splinter caught me in the hop and opens up a whole new load of possibilities. And at another, an unexpected explanation of Roy and Zach's genetic heritage Call to mind James Blish's excellent Panchope stories, collected together in The Seedling Stars. As the story neared its climax, I wondered how the two narratives were going to link up. I knew there was a timing difference, but as Rakesh began to draw closer to his quarry, I imagined all kinds of meetings and events between the main protagonists of the two story strands. I thought I had it pegged, but whether or not I did, I became increasingly excited about what Greg was going to throw at me. And then the narrative ended before any possible interaction could properly begin. This was a big letdown. I wasn't expecting a five-course banquet, but hardly to be tossed a bone was deeply disappointing. As I said at the beginning, entertainment value didn't seem to be a major focus for writing the novel. But it was certainly a major focus in reading it. And for my money, it wasn't properly fulfilled. Three stars. Incandescence by Greg Egan is published by Galanx and distributed in Australia by Hachette. You've been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to featured authors' websites and to their publications and for other information. The rights holder grants a licence to you to download these audio files for your private, personal, domestic, non-commercial use only. You may not use these audio files for any other purpose. Copyright of the stories remains with the author. The book review in this podcast is copyright Keith Stevenson, 2008. Tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. (laughs) 